This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. If we were to conduct an investigation, we could probably determine in some way what percentage of us are armed when we leave the house. But we wouldn't have to look through purses or pat down suit coats or pant legs or anything else. You see, this is not a lesson about your Second Amendment rights. But Peter does tell us as Christians to arm ourselves. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. And specifically, he says it this way. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Second, uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. According to Peter, being armed involves living for God's will and not for the lust of our flesh. In our spiritual struggle, we can't afford to be unarmed. We know that our enemy is armed, don't we? In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, it talks about the flaming arrows of the evil one. Few things are discussed more these days than guns or at least weapons, including bombs and knives as well as rifles and machine guns. Peter addresses the people who were peaceful and even persecuted but who also needed to be armed. As we read his inspired words in our current day, we need to pursue peace, but also to be armed. And Peter helps us to determine the answer to whether or not we are adequately armed. Are you armed? Let's see if we can't get an answer, a biblical answer to that. Number one, you've got to ask yourself, what do you live for? That will help you know whether or not you are adequately armed. That's 1 Peter 4, verse 2 through 7. You know, from the very beginning of this epistle, Peter shows us that most are living for this world, but that the Christians should not feel at home in this world. He calls the original recipients of the letter scattered aliens, uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, not just geographically, but also spiritually. He says, you're pilgrims and strangers in this world, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. They were not to be living for perishable things like gold or silver, 1 Peter 1 verse 7 and 18, or the flesh, or glory, 1 Peter 1 24, or fleshly lust, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. But what a reminder that all of us are living for something. Paul contrasts a life with a mind set on the flesh and one that is set on the spirit in Romans chapter 8, verse 4 through 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. They that set their minds on the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But Peter in our text, he tells us some things that should help us to know which, which mindset we have, what our minds are on. Are you living for the world and for worldly people. That's something that Peter brings up in 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5. For a lot of us, that's what we used to live for. And we all have a lot of co-workers and classmates and friends who seem to see life as one long party that is interrupted only long enough to earn enough to get back to the party. Peter, in fact, calls it carrying out the desire of the Gentiles. And then he defines what that is in verse 3. He says that they are pursuing a course. The word translated pursued a course could be used literally to speak of a specific point of departure or destination like a port. It's interesting that in the parable of the soils, Jesus chose to speak of the thorny soil as those who hear the word and they go on their way. And they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. Go on their way is the same original word that Peter uses that is translated pursue a course. Jesus tells us which way this way is going in Matthew 7 and verse 13 when he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. 
Matthew 7 and verse 13. How can you identify this road of worldliness? The U.S. Geological Survey tells us that interstate highways are made of construction sand, gravel, crushed stone, concrete, compacted soil, asphalt, and even a little bit of steel. Every road is made of something, including the road of life. Peter shows us what the road of worldliness or the moral majority is made of. Its component parts are things like sensuality, he says. And this is behavior completely lacking in moral restraint. And it usually implies the sexually improper or even the sexually promiscuous. This is not just fornication or adultery. But it's also words and dress and actions that are meant to tease, to entice, and attract. If sexual immorality is the fire, then sensuality is the kindling. And then he points to another component of this road. It's lusts, which means to strongly desire to have what belongs to someone else or to engage in an activity which is morally wrong. It includes the sexual, like coveting your neighbor's wife, but it is not limited to this. Maybe as married people, it's flirtation in the workplace or inappropriate texts or messages. Or as unmarried people, it's feeding and fueling desires that cannot be righteously quenched. That's the road that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7 and Peter is talking about in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3-5. through 5. This road is also made up of the ingredient of drunkenness extravagant indulgence and long drawn out drinking bouts, which may induce permanent damage to the body. The death of Alexander the Great, for example, was ascribed to this practice. The National Institute of Health tells us that 57% of those 18 and older reported that they drank in the last month alcoholic beverages. 25% of these reported that they binge drank in the last month. 16.3 16.3 million adults over the age of 18 have an alcohol abuse disorder. That is when a person's drinking causes distress or harm. And that was in 2014 in its statistics. Almost 100,000 people die every year from alcohol-related causes. And so we've got to see that course, as Peter describes it, this worldly course. Another ingredient of this worldly road is is carousing. This is drinking parties involving unrestrained indulgence in alcoholic beverages and the attending immoral behavior. Paul talks about it in Romans 13, 13, when he says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Another element of this road is drinking parties. Uh, uh, That was a social gathering at which wine was served. BDAG, a a lexicon, says that in the Greco-Roman world, it was customary for intellectuals to hold banquets at which topical discussions were featured with participants, rather, well lubricated with wine. There's abominable idolatries that Peter mentions. Part of that road These were things done by Gentiles as part of an unholy lifestyle, which included festive processions on days that were sacred to Bacchus, the wine god, and was characterized by wild revelings, unwholesome songs, and activities. Maybe today we could think Mardi Gras or the like. In the 1960s, they called it sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And even if it doesn't have a name today, it's still around from the frat house to more sophisticated events that are patronized by the fully grown. These are those lusts of men that are set in contrast to the will of God in 1 Peter 4 and verse 2. As Christians, we're not supposed to be living for these lusts, but for His law. And when you avoid those sins, that road made of those ingredients you will be maligned by the people who are doing those very things, verse 4. They can't believe that you can't or that you won't draw a line in the sand and, and avoid their lifestyle. 
Huffington Post a few years ago shared a tweet by Ashley Madison, which specializes in assisting adultery for over 7 million subscribers. They said to their clients, and whoever gets their tweets, score $1 million for scoring with Tim Tebow. And, quote, looks like Tim Tebow may still be a, a virgin for now. Who wants to be a millionaire courtesy of Ashley Madison? Not only do they want to f facilitate illicit sex, they want to seduce those who have moral principles to join them in their ungodly behavior. But Peter tells us that they will have to give an account to God for their behavior, according to verse 5. What are you living for? Peter asks, are you living for the end of all things as well? Verse 6 and 7. Isn't Peter saying that those saints who had been persecuted and died, who were harshly judged by their fellow men, were judged differently by the supreme judge of the universe, God? The immoral spoke evil of them. But they are declared alive by God because they responded as they should to the gospel. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6 is written in the negative to avoid the sins of the world committed by men who persecute those who don't join in with them. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11 is written in the positive, encouraging us to live a certain way in order to glorify God and to be prepared for the end of all things. Now, Peter makes this point throughout this short letter that we need to be sound in our judgment and sober in our minds. And the first thing he mentions to help us accomplish that is prayer. In other words, make spiritually smart decisions. And that means avoiding worldly activities like in 1 Peter 4 and verse 3. But also prepare for the life to come by keeping your mind on things above. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. How often do you pray about maintaining right thinking about this world and the world which is to come? You see, it requires us to discipline our minds and thinking to live for more than this life. The flesh is what we can see and feel and experience. But spiritual living according the, to the Word of God and following that Word is the course that we must pursue. When you think about politics... Every election cycle is just like the last, except only more extreme. And in those election cycles, it's full of digging up the, the dirt and the past of each candidate. And, and with uh, the candidates in every election, you can measure the dirt by the ton. Every position that you've ever taken, every picture that you've ever taken, every failure and scandal, all your past and present, how you walk, how you talk, I can't imagine the pressure. But do we realize, you and I, that while our lives may not be splashed across CNN or Fox or the Internet, that we must be careful about how we are living our lives in view of the end of all things? We must be armed with the purpose of Christ and we must live with the end in mind to see if we are, are armed as we should be. We need to ask how we're living according to 1 Peter 4, 1 through 7. Are we properly armed? Are you? Second, ask yourself, how do you treat other Christians? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Now Peter shifts focus from how we interact with the world to how Christians interact with other Christians. Just as we need to be equipped to properly handle the world, we need to be equipped to properly treat one another. How do we treat each other? Well, according to Peter, we must love one another. That's verse 8. And Peter puts this, if you'll notice in the, in the text, above all. And above all, Look at the love we should have for each other. Number one, the love must be constant. Keep fervent. That means without ceasing, continuously in your love for one another. This describes the quality of the love that we need to have for each other. He mentions this fervent love as an outgrowth of obedience and being born again back in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. The world needs to see Christians showing love to each other more now than ever before. And in the atmosphere that the Christians were facing in Peter's day, brotherly love was vital. 
He says, fervently and sincerely love one another from the heart. 1 Peter 1, 22. He says, broadly, love the brotherhood. 1 Peter 2, 17. He says, fervently love each other. Right here in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. And he ends the letter by saying, greet one another with a kiss of love. 1 Peter 5, 14. We cannot let the world influence us, nor can we be indifferent to each other's lives if we're Christians. People in the world turn against each other on the basis of their politics or their skin color or their age. If we succumb to those kind of culture wars, we surrender a powerful weapon in our warfare. We are not properly armed. But this love also must be concealing, not necessarily a concealed weapon, but a love that itself conceals. Because Peter says, for love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, our love will choose to cover rather than magnify one another's faults and shortcomings. Because we recognize our need of each other in this world, we won't be hypercritics, assuming the worst of each other or being impatient with each other. I want to remind you of how Paul, by the moving of the Holy Spirit, defines love. He says, love is kind, is patient. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love is so important if we're going to be properly armed. But along with that, we must be hospitable to one another. Verse 9, this is how a Christian treats another Christian. The shepherd of Hermas, as quoted by the apostolic fathers, describes hospitality in early Christianity. Elders gladly received into their houses at all times the servants of God without hypocrisy. And at all times without ceasing sheltered the needy and the widows in their ministration and conducted themselves in purity at all times. Hospitality is a powerful way to arm ourselves for our purpose as Christians. By opening our homes, we lower people's defenses and shatter their isolation. And Peter reminds us to do it without complaint. There must be something to that. We also must serve one another, verse 10. Whatever God blesses us with, we are to use to serve one another. Peter says that we are a living demonstration of God's grace when we lower ourselves for one another. And when we do, we act like Jesus and we obey His will for our lives. You might recall that Jesus once said to His disciples, Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, verse 26 through 28 of Matthew 20. To be properly armed requires not just a proper relationship with the world, but a healthy relationship with the children of God. Are you properly armed? A third question to ask in order to answer that is, what authority do you follow? Verse 11. You know, when you think about uh, Second Amendment rights and gun laws, you're thinking about the government. Are we thinking about the divine government in our lives? You see, the most important relationship that we can ever have is with God. And you'll notice what Peter says that, uh, about this at the end of this paragraph in 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11. Peter talks about our speaking and our serving. That is what we say and what we do. How are you able to speak the utterance of God? Well, you've got to learn what they are. You've got to study. We need to be very careful to know and to follow the will of God in our lives. And this requires a knowledge of His living and enduring Word. 1 Peter 1, 23-25. You've got to be in the book, the Bible. Now, how are you able to serve? Well, God gives you the strength. We arm ourselves by plugging into God's power source. And when we speak and when we serve, we are to give Him the glory. 
You see, this is His Word. And it is His strength that makes it possible for us to endure trials from the world and to encourage our brethren. We are powerless without His strength. That is true for any individual congregation of God's people. All the good that is ever accomplished, whether in soul winning or in mission work, every victory that is achieved by the people of God, everything good that we do is because He enables us to do it. When the world looks at us and are drawn to Jesus, it is because of who God is, not because of who we are. Now, look back through the entire paragraph, and I mean 1 Peter 4, 1 through 11. As we see this, this passage, we understand that we operate according to the will of God, verse 1 and 6. We try to demonstrate the manifold grace of God, verse 10. We speak the oracles of God, verse 11. We serve by the strength of God, verse 11, and we do all for the glory of God, verse 11. Do you see a thread through all of that? It's God. It's all about Him. It's not about us. And with that understanding, we we know that there is no threat that the world can throw at us. And there is no problem that we might have with each other that cannot be solved if we are trying to let everything we say and everything that we do be led by God. It was the Apostle Paul in a different letter who said, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father, Colossians 3 and verse 17. The focus in everything religiously should always be, what does God want? What does God say? Is that what power do we find in what God gives? Remember how we started the lesson? We asked the question, are you armed? I don't know where you thought we might be going with that, but that's where Peter goes with it. We're told to arm ourselves with suffering like he suffered. And Peter calls it our purpose. I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily embrace that joyfully. I've got to arm myself with suffering. But it makes me ask, why did he suffer? It's because he chose to live for the world to come and not for this world. And that's the same challenge that you and I face today. We are foregoing the way the world says to live so that we can live with him. Our values, our priorities, our conduct, our speech cannot be the same as the world's is. That's the point of Peter. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We're not like this world, though we live in it. You can still find a copy of Alvin York's diary, but I will warn you that he's got the grammar of an uneducated farm boy from the Sequatchie Valley of Tennessee. But the entry for October 8, 1918, is his perspective of his single-handed capture of 132 German soldiers. Also included by the one who preserved and compiled the diary are the affidavits of several U.S. soldiers attesting to York's incredible capture. At the end of that day's entry, he credits God for helping him out. He said, I held the rifle, but God gave the victory. And his last words on the matter were particularly enlightening. He says, now he will save you if you will only trust him. Well, it leads us right back to the question. Are you properly armed? Well, how can I know that, Neil? Let's ask Peter. Peter, am I properly armed? Well, number one, what are you living for? Are you living for this world or are you living for the world to come? Number two, if you're a Christian, how are you treating your brethren? Are you treating them in the way that verse 8 through 10 tells you that you should? And what authority are you following? Are you following the Lord or are you following yourself? You know, 
I don't want that to be a concealed thing either. I want to open carry. I want everyone to know that the power of overcoming, the power of living the way God wants me to live is that which I learn by respecting and following the Word of God. Shouldn't that always be our desire and our approach in everything? Shouldn't we want to make sure that we have armed ourselves with the salvation of Christ? Let me ask you, have you submitted to the Lord's will for your life? 1 Peter 3, 21 says, In the same way as Noah and his family were saved from the destruction of the flood through the ark, in the same way baptism also now saves you, not by itself. There's also a, a, a need to know why you're doing that and having faith in the plan that God has for us through His Son, Jesus Christ, that leads us to repent of our sins and to be baptized. That's how we arm ourselves against the great onslaught and enemy of sin. I want to encourage you to reach out to us and let's reason together. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Study together and see what God says about how to be armed for the world which is to come.